Welcome to News from Underground, your source and place on the internet for consistent anarchist news. And today we have a new, uh, well, returning co-host, Ty. Um, like, talk about stuff you're interested in or things you're into these days. Uh, yeah, my name is Michael Tiger Shinzius, or Ty, as Cal just called me. Um, I would consider myself an anarchist of uh, some sort, so I don't usually wear that label. But I'm very into pursuing the path of nonviolence in my own life consistently and thoroughly. I talk about living a life of thorough nonviolence or thorough peace. And for me, my inroad into that was through a study of philosophy and just uh, you know wanting to live a better life myself in, in, in my own being. And uh, I just find that I'm happier <laughs> and I feel like I'm a better person when I'm peaceful. And so that, you know, that that's led me to some associations with some uh, liberty groups and anarchist groups, and in my quest for truth and knowledge on these topics, I'm participating in this new show today. So thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Uh, great ally in fighting for the good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and pretty soon we're going to be um, bringing back uh, stoicism again. So that'll be more info to stay tuned for. That too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the uh, first article we have... All right. Um, Bitcoin's capital controls resistance, a concern, says IMF, as $1 trillion leaves China. Fiat currencies and commodities have been sliding downwards against the U.S. dollar for some time as investors are closely watching China and its floundering economy. With the Shanghai Composite Index in a downward spiral, reports of rumored tighter capital controls in China continue to build. In result, Bitcoin may once again experience a windfall as Beijing tightens its grip to prevent capital from fleeing offshore. However, authorities are well aware of cryptocurrencies and the subject has come up in certain think tank reports, the IMF, and during the recent World Economic Forum in Davos. So uh, they say a trillion dollars in wealth has left China. Uh, and they say and they claim that this is through Bitcoin, which I actually find that um, the word left, a little bit suspect. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that most of the people in China that have Bitcoin, it's they're still using it in China. Right. They just don't want the Chinese government's greedy fingers into it. So right. by left, they mean we don't control anymore. And, and what is the what scares tyrants more than not being able to control something? So pretty much, uh, they're talking about being angry that people are finding better ways of hiding their property from robbers. And right, thieves. exactly. Uh, and sometimes they say some uh, private properties like uh, like land, for example, uh, like in place when taxes go up, land values, is, uh, property taxes, is the one that goes up the most because mm -hmm. you can't really hide your, your land from the government. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, interesting because China has some really large Bitcoin exchange markets out there. Oh yeah, well, it's it's actually a lot of people think that China is is the driver behind uh, Bitcoin now because it's it exploded so much in China that uh, there are so many miners in China that people think that's that's actually driving the mining of Bitcoin. Um, some of that is a lot of people take that into the sort of conspiracy theory realm where they think that they've got like centralized uh, mining pools in China that control. The entire you know Bitcoin space, which I think is complete bunk. I, I don't think that's you know I think that's ridiculous. But even if that were true, how would that affect your interpretation of this story? Um, that would add for well, so as far as the Chinese citizens go, um, yeah. I I think that would be great for them because yeah. that means that they have you know they have a lot of control in in the bitcoin market and, and they do have a lot of control mm -hmm. you know in a in a decentralized sense um certainly um but uh either way you know i think it would be difficult for and this is one of the draws for bitcoin i think it would be difficult for the chinese government to be able to seize any of this mm -hmm. you know and even if they did they they wouldn't be able to seize 51% of it, right. so, uh, which would be required for a, you know, not 51%, but just over 50% for a, uh, a serious attack on the network. But um, 
I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's doing a lot of good out there, and I think this is actually one of one of the the best stories for the future of, mm-hmm. of humanity in general. <laughs> if China, the you know, the, imagine if Bitcoin made it into North Korea, right? <laughs> that would be, how great would that be? I mean, if you know, in China, one of the most one of the strictest, um, it, it, they have some of the strictest uh, handholds on the on the. Um, on the internet econ- economy there and the internet yeah, yeah. but uh, they have such a stranglehold on the on the economy and the, on the monetary system and they're they've lost track of a trillion dollars that's right because true. their that's citizens the are escaping they're escaping and i i just think that's phenomenal news i think that's great there's so, finding ways to kind of survive in that 1984 esque world or that's a lot more darker than what we find here uh, yeah. in comparison you can say imagine um, man, imagine what what that what using Bitcoin must have on their their citizen score? <laughs> <laughs> have you heard about that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. so. Bitcoin. Who's <laughs> points on that one? I did so, some research on some uh, on some of your neighbors. Okay, that guy's got a really low citizen credit score. I bet he has Bitcoin. I can go over there and buy some. So, can, can you speak maybe briefly about? Uh, I think some viewers might see this story as negative that, you know, oh, look at what the state is doing in response here. This is scary or this is bad. Um, and you see it very positively, as do I. I, I just want you – could you lay out why this is uh, maybe good news for a movement of people interested in liberty that we see this as a reaction from the state of China? Right. So the um, the reason why I think it's good news is because I don't think China has – I don't think the state has a, a say in it. You know, even even if they do a complete cut off of you know the, with the the great firewall of China, uh, which I don't think they'll do. I think that would be disastrous for the for the government. Um, but even if they did try that, you would still have a Bitcoin network within China. Mm-hmm. So they would still be thriving in that atmosphere. I would be upset because I would lose you know a good Bitcoin or two on on an exchange. Right. But you know. Um, it, that I mean, they, they can't do anything to stop it. it, it at least, you know, it, it would be. It's very difficult for them to. So I, I think it's like floundering. Right. So it's kind of yeah. showing the I don't know what you call it, but yeah, this this floundering action from, from the tyrants that wish to control this and uh, they won't be able to. How could they? <laughs> where's Where's the Bitcoin bank? Yeah. <laughs> where are you hiding your bitcoins? That's well, that that actually leads me. <laughs> to the, the, the final point, the People's Bank of China is actually, they've been talking about creating a centralized cryptocurrency. No one's going to go for that. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> Missed the point much? Yeah. <laughs> you don't quite get it. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So it's, is, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to, nobody's going to care about that. They won't do it. It's yeah. designed to be an underground currency, so really bringing attention and use to this by the government mm-hmm. there is like the last thing they want to do. Because uh, you can't really regulate ones and zeros out there. Yeah. Uh, there's it's decentralized. There's no location. It's like the TSA was pulling over the sky, seeing that he uh, he was an advocacy for Bitcoin, and said, right, yeah. where, "Where are your Bitcoins? You know, where are you hiding?" <laughs> it's like, what? We know you got them in there. Take them out of your duffel bag. They're in my bits, <laughs> right? And it goes to show that at the same time, in terms of government, you're also dealing with dinosaurs. These are people who are not uh, well literate in, in the world of uh, the 21st century of computers and. Or we're going technology wise. You have people like John McCain who doesn't even know how to email, right? So, yeah, you're, you're dealing with old, old people. People, yeah. I mean, when you have these welfare positions in government, it doesn't behoove you to continue to kind of grow. You're kind of, you're cemented there in that position. So, yeah, they, they, can't, cannot, they can't keep up with any of this stuff. They, won't, they can't keep up with what, um, what, what people, I guess, in, in the market and whatnot can kind of create. Um, that's, a, that's one of the things I've, um, so I've been following uh, uh, what's John McAfee's. Uh, you know who John McAfee is? Mm-hmm. I've been following his presidential cam- uh, campaign a little bit, and you know I don't support anybody for president, but um, but he does make some interesting points. Like he he has a picture uh, on uh, that he uploads with uh, with Donald Trump's desk, not a single computer on his desk, and he's, <laughs> he makes this point that these people they are not particularly computer literate. How are they qualified to run an entire country that is run? By that is, you know, it's fueled by computers, right? 
Then it goes in a time to uh, Leonard Reed's I pencil. Like, mm -hmm. one, can, you, can you make a pencil yourself? You know, how can one person think you make all the uh, small decisions that Marcus does in the billion times over? But that includes uh, all kinds yep. of different intricacies of uh, resources and inputs and outputs, and it's it's mind boggling. No, no one person can do that. Um, to to think that one person can, it's uh, and if anything, any time they they. Anytime they try to centralize this, anytime they try, they fail miserably. Mm -hmm. and, and this is this is actually a story that I, I thought about bringing up. Venezuela, they're tanking. Their their entire economy is just on a downward spiral. They now have bread lines. Yeah, uh, real <laughs> bread lines, even for toilet paper, for for diapers, mm -hmm. uh, for electronics. Well, uh, they had a they had a toilet paper shortage crisis right. just like a couple years ago. Yeah. yeah. But but I mean they they've had they've had food lines for a while though I think mm -hmm. like it's been it's actually been a while where it would they they had serious quotas at grocery stores and grocery stores but um, yeah so it, it's it, they've been in pretty crappy straits for a while now I think I think right now it's just getting especially bad because the oil prices are going down. what's uh, Bitcoin activity like there is there any yes uh, so. Mm -hmm. Like for for example, there's there's, there's uh, I read a lot of stories about people in South America using Bitcoin in, in terms of like people always trying to find ways to send money to their family back there, and uh, Bitcoin's a great way to do. Instead of trying to do it the Western Union or a lot of other hassle ways here in the United States in particular. So um, yeah, this I've I've read stories of people uh, trading Bitcoin out there, uh, selling mm -hmm. Bitcoin, uh, people finding ways to kind of get money to their families, and yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a I remember reading a story of a guy in Japan who's wife was in Europe grocery shopping and there was a grocery shopping store there accepted Bitcoin. So she took a picture of the QR code that showed the price, texted it to him, scanned the QR code using an app and uh, sent Bitcoins and paid for it. Done. There you go. Right? <laughs> so yeah. I've seen good activities there. I think particularly in uh, Chile, there's uh, Bitcoin activity there yeah. as well. Um, but yeah, I find it to be, because uh, I, I have a lot of, I guess, immigrant families here and a lot of people who, uh, from Bolivia, have been, there's always been that thing, just sending money to family there. And, mm -hmm. That has to go through. Like with Bitcoin, you don't, you no longer have to try to hide money trying to go to the airports and trying to go to your country or your home. Or if you have like ten thousand dollars a morning, they'll take that from you. Uh, but Bitcoin, just send it. It's like yeah, done. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, they make you declare anything over like fifty dollars now, and it's ridiculous. I remember reading the story of this old uh, like grandmother just like strapping cash on her trying to go to the airport, and uh, and the TSA uh, extortion sound it took it from her. Um, so it's yeah. fucking ridiculous. Well, I mean, the wealthy used to be the only ones that really had control over digital transfers of wealth, mm -hmm. of, fiat, of fiat currency. Um, but, you know, I mean, they don't carry, you know, millions of dollars of cash over the border to Switzerland. So it time. happens electronically. It, it goes there and uh, no one knows about it. And they can hide assets in that way. And now through Bitcoin, anyone can do the same thing. And it's kind of, for people are now using the same type of tool or the same type of action that <laughs> the, the powerful used to use right. to avoid the intervention of the state and the state is now concerned. <laughs> you make up a good point in terms of All another uh, reason too, I guess, Easily over understand Bitcoin. People say, "Well, it's digital currency. I can't hold it." Well, most money these days are, are yeah. digital. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's, um, that's a, a point that uh, Andreas Antonopoulos. I think it was Andreas Antonopoulos made uh, about he he actually um, uh, he says that Bitcoin is is more in in the anarcho mutualist sphere uh, rather mm -hmm. than the anarcho capitalist sphere, and he, and he says this because uh, I, I think it, it's because of how how it basically spreads the uh, the the control of wealth to you know the lower classes, um, in, in which I would actually disagree with him on not not on that but on the on the point of it being anarcho mutualist because I think that is very much a capitalist effect in in spreading the control of uh, the monetary control you know among people mm -hmm. because it's that's that's I mean right down to the the cell phone the iPhone that everybody. That mm -hmm. I mean, even people that don't have a TV have an iPhone, you know. Right. Uh, Seven billion people on this planet. Six billion of them have phones. Yeah. Uh, and that's all you need. And just thirty-five years ago, yeah. a cell phone was only owned by the you know by millionaires with, and they were like this big. Right. We chose and didn't create that. Right. right. 
the whatever is left out there in capitalism, the vestige of it, uh, help kind of create that. I'll, I'll leave it at this maybe though, and this is a conversation we were having before off, off camera about uh, Bitcoin is a currency that's not commodity based and it's not a tangible piece of property. And it's, so I can understand the argument for mutualism that Bitcoin is an agreement to exchange something between people, an exchange of value or debt. Um, something like that. There, there are many ways to interpret it. But uh, yeah, I think, I think we're looking at a new paradigm, at least in our lifetimes, of exchanging value um, because even the digital money that we'd exchange, the fiat currency, you know, with a credit card or a debit card or something, um, we, we're so used to having those tangible dollars and the state's control over it and the state treats that entity of, of the U.S. dollar very much like it treats physical, tangible goods. Mm -hmm. Someone can steal my dollar and, <laughs> and I've lost that value. And, and Bitcoin operates slightly different than that. So I can understand that critique uh, where it comes from. Right. Yeah. Well, you can put, uh, that, that is actually one thing, and this, I think you brought this up earlier. Uh, you can put, um, it, it's like a type of cold storage, I think, that you can put mm -hmm. Bitcoin in. And you can actually have, you know, Bitcoin notes and mm -hmm. um, if you, and, and since it, Bitcoin is basically uncrackable uh, on the, you know, once quantum computing comes out, that's a whole different story. Well, but then, right now, well, anti security measures will just keep up with that as they always sound like. Right, yeah, I, I, I agree. But, um, but it, the, basically, what you can do is have, have, this, have these notes and have the, the uh, uh, maybe have an RFID chip in it or something with, with the, um, the uh, code, the, I'm forgetting the, the private address, mm -hmm. or have it uh, printed on it or something like that, and you can actually pass these out as notes to, to have a physical right. um, Bitcoin. All right, people have done the they print it out, keep it in their yeah. safe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting world we're kind of living in with this decentralized currency. Now there's decentralized uh, ways in which you can rent homes, like Airbnb. Decentralized ways in terms of uh, mobility, in terms of uh, Uber and Lyft, uh, stuff that is uh, it's just, it's really like challenging these cartel monopolies that have been existing for a long time. Um, yeah, interesting future mm -hmm. we're kind of living in and see what kind of comes out of that, um, especially in China right now with this. The uh, next story we're going to bring up, uh, court rules, Michigan has no responsibility to provide quality public education. And Detroit, in a blow to school children statewide, the Michigan Court of Appeals ruled on November 7th the state of Michigan has no legal obligation to provide a quality public education to students in the struggling Highland Park School District. So interesting uh, about that. You know, so it says the appellate court said the state has no constitutional requirement to ensure school children actually learn fundamental skills such as reading, but rather is obligated only to establish and finance a public education system, regardless of quality. So I only have the obligation to rob everyone uh, to fund these uh, public indoctrination mm -hmm. camps. Uh, and that's about it. So when people, which, is, which I think is a great thing that the courts admit that because uh, a lot of people say, well, without government, you won't have cops or police. It's mm -hmm. like, well, there's no obligation for them to protect you. Supreme Court cases have already ruled that. Winnie yeah. Vega versus DeShaney County. This is great. Now we can use this as an example. And to talk about, well, you have no education. Well, the Supreme Court has already ruled that <laughs> they have no obligation to provide you education. And this is, this, this is just like, the, this is exactly like the situation in Flint. You are required to pay for it, but we have no obligation of giving you the quality product. Right. So the people in Flint are required to pay for water, but they don't have to get, you know, they don't, Flint doesn't have to opt to give them good quality water. So they have water filled with lead and arsenic. And in Detroit, you're required, you still have to pay, you're, you're required to pay for the school, and your, your poor children are required to go to the school, but the state has no obligation to actually give them a quality education or a quality product by any means. Right, right. but I mean, uh, there are multiple ways to respond to this, and some people might respond by going, that's absurd, of course they have an obligation to provide a quality education. I agree. They don't have this obligation, uh, they don't, should not be required. Uh, the problem with this story uh, isn't that the, the state has told the truth about itself, the problem is that it's still compelling students mm. and Absolutely. families. Right. And, and it's just, 
maybe this story will help burst the bubble of those that believe in the virtues of public education. I, I, I sure hope so. I mean, yeah. you know, it, back when, when, well, not even back, even very recently, when we would argue about public education, the, the, the saying would be, oh, you're against public education? Why are you against education? Right. <laughs> yeah, education is something that's uh, innate. Uh, the desire and want to learn is not something that you give to some, someone, it's something that they're born with. And yeah, uh, the kind of uh, information that they pass here uh, in terms of education is, um, yeah, the quality has gone down over the many decades. And that's what happens when you kind of monopolize these sort of areas. You have people in, believe in, uh, like in New York City, uh, high school graduates, like over like 90% uh, literacy rate, and they still can't read when I'm graduating from high school. Um, and now the reading grade levels have gone down and down over the time, over the centuries. And I think you, you need like uh, newspapers today, right? On like fourth, fifth grade reading level. Really, really low. Uh, political speeches. Political speeches are generally <laughs> like <laughs> the, the average political speech. It has about a fourth, fifth grade um, comprehension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's on its way towards creating that idiocracy of that movie that uh, it's trying to try not to invest um, or say this is the future or like uh, look for like Brave New World um, in terms of how they kind of brainwash, I guess, the, or remove the uh, future children and generations of their ability to kind of grasp and understand concepts kind of growing up. So, yeah, there's a lot of dumbing down. There's, not, there's no education there. I've never got anything of value going to a public indoctrination camp for yeah. those uh, 12 years. Um, Nothing. I can't, I can't uh, remember anything of quality, anything that I found to be of, of value. Um, just, uh, yeah, just a lot of uh, moving people around like, like cattle from one room to the next. Um, and a lot of uh, strict obedience. If you want to use the washroom, you have to ask permission. You can't do it out of your own volition. Uh, yeah, the whole, and of course, in, in terms of truancy, of course, if you miss a class or two in places like Texas, they'll send, you're, they'll send you to, to a cage. They, they send to a little girl whose family was uh, rife with poverty. Sometimes they work and sometimes they're going to make it to, to school. And the judge says, well, we've got a truancy law. Have a good night in the cage. Um, so yeah, there's, these are not education systems. They're, they're prison pens for, for children, uh, destroying and eviscerating their, their, their minds or ability to understand the world around them. They have uh, places like uh, 14, 14 states that have a okay, corporal punishment. Then it's okay for teachers to beat the crap out of students. Yes. There, there are schools to have like like these uh these like like small cells where they just throw the kid in there with padded walls and keep them in there. Uh, yeah, these these are not places that you want to bring children to. <laughs> these these are bullying centers. Um, when people talk about like, where all this violence is coming from, or like when it was like, wow, those good parents. Like, what well, the environment that you're sending your kids to. Um, their parents might not be peaceful. Their parents might might be abusing their kid, and that interaction is really throwing them into like a um, uh, what, what is the name of the story? Was the kids are on that island by themselves? Lord of the, Lord of the Flies. Flies, right? Yeah. It's like I mean, these these kids are coming there, and they're they're acting very violent. Like, where do you think they learned this this stuff from? It's not like they were, they had a clean slate and came on this island together. It's like their parents were probably abusing the fuck out of them before that too, yeah. and then they're just kind of repeating and uh, marrying that kind of behavior back to each other. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing good I've ever I've seen to come out of these places. No, and the rhetoric of the state in response to its own quality of education is mostly that the state should be providing the same education to everyone across America, across socioeconomic lines, across racial lines. You know, the decision Brown v. Board of Education just said that separate was inherently unequal, that you had to have equal education provided provided to the people. It doesn't say how good it has to be. Uh, no child left behind. Again, that the right. federal government can enter, can, can mandate that states meet certain requirements, you know, common core across the board. Common core, exactly. That what, what a child learns in one state will be the same thing they learn in another state. But it doesn't matter how high that bar is, really. And it doesn't matter uh, if you can actually, <laughs> actually teach anyone these things. What matters is that we apply a standard across everyone, and that's kind of the rhetoric they use to try to justify public schools. Um, and it's interesting just to see them being honest about it, you know, that we're concerned with making sure that everyone is treated the same, but we're not very concerned about how well that is. Right. You know, uh, well, I think they kind of have to acknowledge it, although yeah. I say, uh, um, well, they have to give up uh, a lot of money, right? <laughs> in terms of yeah. being sued. Uh, same thing, of course, if um, 
the Supreme Court did not uphold that police have no obligation, they'd be sued all the time. <laughs> Where were you on time? You know, I caught you, you know, five minutes ago. So yeah, there's no obligation. We'll get there when we get there. Uh, yeah, here's your education. You know, we can't really guarantee quality. So you can't really sue in, in that, the type of act. Um, there'd be court cases all across uh, the tax farms. So it's in their, I guess, vested interest because Although that takes money away from uh, the men in black robes themselves, <laughs> they're, they're kind of dependent on that kind of money. There won't be any, any more to sustain their lifestyle of uh, yeah, violently hurting people. Um, but that's uh, Michigan. A lot of crazy stuff has been happening there now. <laughs> the water thing too. Yeah, that, that's crazy. Uh, you're, you're forced. Let's say, well, there's liquid. We consider that water. Dude, it's poison. No, it's liquid. It's water. You still got to pay for it. <laughs> Hey, here's a, here's a school, here's some chairs, a blackboard. All right, you still got to pay for it. It's like, dude, I'm not learning anything. You can't even read. No, you still, it's, it's education. Um, hey, there's a guy with a badge, gun. There, there's security. It's like, he, he's, he's always failing. He never arrives on time. <laughs> um, yeah, it's completely absurd. Uh, and in a free society, they go bankrupt. They, they, they could not function in, a, in yes. such a system like that. And they will not have anyone patronizing or subscribers. Uh, in, in any means. Now, that's a horrible business plan. We'll provide the service when we feel like it. All right, well, good luck. You're not getting my money. <laughs> uh, they're, they're in a, the business is arrested not under what they can offer, but if people want it themselves. Right? There's a demand for that. Um, yeah, this is horrific. Horrific. And I think many people will look at this story and, and think, well, oh, well, l let's get this appealed again and go to the district court. And get it overturned so that you know the, we we do have an obligation. The state does have an obligation to provide quality education to the Highland Park School District. Right. And as long as that's the thought process of anyone that actually cares about people getting a good education, we're not going to win. We're not going to end up in a position where finally we've wrangled the state into being perfectly virtuous and staying that way because. By definition, it inherently cannot do that. It's always going to use its only tools that it has at its disposal, which is violence, oppression, coercion. Right. And no matter how well they do one piece of what you know they're mandating that we allow them to do, uh, it's going to employ disgusting means to pull it off. And we should we should stop requesting that they do it. I think the reaction to this story is great. You're right. You do have no obligation. Please. Stop. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want you to be obligated to give a quality education because we don't want you to be obligated to give any education. And we don't want to be compelled to right. participate. I think that would be a wonderful response, but I don't anticipate such a response from people in the school district, and I understand why. Right. Um, and it's a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult story to respond to, I imagine, uh, as a resident of the area. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of... Um, Unfortunately, a lot of what's happening in Michigan, to the contrast of, of our earlier story, is, uh, is showing how much people will put up with and sit down and take it. All right. Well, again, the, these people have never been presented the alternative in which we're mm -hmm. talking about on the show. How about none of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's some, well, we need education. They always talk about, you know, A or B, government, government. Uh, they've never been shown off to see yeah. uh, none of the above or the arguments we're talking about. So uh, maybe they have heard of it or, or introduced at some yeah. point. That would be something for them to consider and start taking a real uh, movement in the better direction that they need to go to. Speaking of movements. <laughs> Speaking of movements, uh, closed borders advocacy. We've had a, recently a few uh, allegedly libertarian <laughs> thinkers, if you will, um, come out advocating for closed borders, the United States specifically closing its borders and, and arguing for this from the libertarian standpoint. Um, we had uh, Christopher Cantwell, is that correct? Yeah. And Stefan Molyneux. Uh, is there anyone else that, was, that you can think of recently? Uh, I guess, I'm not quite sure, maybe Hoppe to a certain extent. Uh, I think I saw someone from the Mises Institute making some claim about this, or someone affiliated with them, which I thought was a little bit surprising. Um, Is but, it Papa affiliated with the Mises Institute? I think he has his own yeah. uh, thing out there in Europe, and it's a castle, and it's wife's castle, I mean to say. Um, so, but, but basically, the, the, let's go through some of the arguments that these people have been making, uh, which is that uh, if you're for liberty, if you want to annihilate the government in America, for example, 
um, by having an open border, what you do is you're allowing people to come into America, mostly from the South, from Mexico, Central and South American countries, and they're gonna, there's an influx of these people into America. And the argument goes that these people statistically are more likely to support bigger government. And that in the long run, these people are going to bring about a situation in America um, that is going to be more tyrannical. And so the argument is we need to employ this measure of, of closing the borders so that we can have, <laughs> you know, have this, the, the people in America that are more savvy to the liberty movement um, you know, have, have us in, in insulation be able to influence our political elite uh, toward limited government and then no government, right. and that this is uh, the better tactical uh, direction to go in than following the libertarian principle of free movement, open borders, and allowing people to come into uh, the nation. That That is the argument from them, and right. uh, I think that this argument is absurd. Uh, you cannot violate your own principles to seek an end in accordance with those principles. I mean, you, you just skip right ahead to the immoral end that you were wishing to avoid. Compromising so your principles yeah. for politics. Absolutely. It's the and, same thing that, uh, that the yeah. communists like to drive with is uh, the ends justify the means. Right, there you and go. It's, it's this attempt at utilitarianism, which, which isn't even, it's not even a, a guaranteed outcome. That, I mean, it's, so, but, it, but the whole thing about, uh, you know, white people being more apt to, to be freedom lovers, that's why, you know, that's why Norway and Sweden are, are such small <laughs> so, uh, Look at all that freedom there. Right, it, it's, an abs- it's an absurd argument. Uh, there are versions of that argument that are quite clearly racist. Uh, mm-hmm. I think Cantwell's version of the argument was quite clearly a racist argument. Well, Cantwell is yeah. just legitimately scared of the Mexicans importing socialism like they did in Germany. Right, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened, right? I'm pretty sure, I'm, according to history. I mean, right. The German man was, uh, was really talking about, hey, we're coming in. <laughs> we got some surprise for you. Um, yeah, and also the polls, I always draw into question in terms of the way that is uh, interpreted because the polls are not uh, objective or unbiased themselves. But again, they always tell you option A or B. They never tell you how about none of the above, how about no government interference. So, for example, there, I remember this poll that was showing which was saying like females here uh, are not in kind of freedom because they advocate against the legalization of cannabis. Um, males, though, advocate for the legalization, so they're more inclined and trying to draw this as further. Well, males are more inclined to freedom than females. Like, well, none of them have ever been presented, regardless of uh, option right. C, none of the above, right? It's always be government or government, legalize or illegalize it. Uh, but at the same time, they forget that even if you make it legalized, if you legalize it, you're still, uh, so a slave of hand uh, gesture, you, you're still the same violence. If you don't uh, still follow rules, you'll still be thrown into a cage. If you still don't give up money for it, you'll still be thrown into a cage. Um, nothing two changes. Options, either right. illegal or regulated. Right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yes, it's, it's an absurd stance to take to presume to know a decision that someone will make in the future at all. Right. Now the statistical argument, if you based on polls or uh, whatever other data you want to argue on, sure you could you could look at that and say um, Hispanic people in the past have voted for stronger government than uh, Caucasian people in America. I don't even know if that's true, but it, someone could hypothetically make that argument, but. To presume, then, necessarily, that Hispanic people entering the United States will do that is preposterous. Well, when you, when you go into a, um, financial, uh, like, like Bitcoin speculation or, or stock speculation, one of, the, one of the main things they teach you is that past performance does not guarantee future results. Correct. And that's because this is driven by people. People do not... People are not necessarily consistent throughout their lives. Mm-hmm. I used to be very liberal. I am no longer liberal. <laughs> so now you're a conservative. <laughs> right. A majority <laughs> of over the 100 uh, anarchists here in our tribe, a uh, majority used to be former socialists. They used to be yeah. Democrats, a majority of Democrats uh, and uh, Republicans. So and they've come to find freedom and to accept uh, these principles and to, yeah. to live in accordance with that and respect tribal property, um, you know, respect of uh, our 
self-ownership come? I'd have to put myself in the camp as well. I came from a left, liberal, progressive, voted Democrat at one point, voted Green, and uh, found myself not wanting to vote for anybody ever again. Yeah. So. I don't need to participate in my own enslavement. I don't need a stranger telling me how to run my life. Right. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I find uh, then a lot of these polls that people kind of analyze from the armchair mm-hmm. hunters from their environment are comes generally from people who've not made a general uh, attempt to show whether or not this can be true. Going around in their community to say, well, the poll says that you can't understand freedom. Well, let's give that a try and test. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I find a lot of this to be very curmudgeon and misanthropic, and I don't really see any of these particular people who advocate these bridges to actually go out there and test those, yeah. that hypothesis. Um, well, we, we all know how much of a friendly, happy guy Cantwell right. is. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, he's undermining his own case right here. If his claim, I mean, if his claim is uh, that you know the American people or white people are somehow more pro liberty than Hispanics by taking the stance he's taking to wish to close the borders, it, that's anti liberty. I mean, in his own definition, you know, I happen to hold that opinion, but uh, of liberty that he holds that. Uh, Open borders would be this ideal. Well, own it. Don't support anything that's against that ideal. I right. think I think this is a, an example potentially. I, I don't know the man, but for for people that um, are feeling uh, you know influenced by that line of argument, um, maybe someone else that does go, you know, oh, you know, I really do believe in liberty and open borders, but ooh, those Hispanics, that's going to be a problem. You know, uh, I think there there are people that they're letting some of their racial prejudices and their own sense of superiority, which is obviously absurd. We all know. Overpower the principles that they claim to hold. And that's a very, very dangerous. You can tell just by looking at Cantwell that he's from the master race. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So sometimes they kind of go back to saying that, well, on average, uh, you know, this certain type of subset of the population uh, in the world uh, create these uh, great things uh, in history. But now you're doing the same thing which you're trying to uh, say, I had something to do with that. Uh, it's like watching soccer games. Like, you know, we are, you know, DC United beat, uh, you know, whatever, Galaxy. Uh, so, but you had nothing to do with that. You know, you're cheering for that sort of stuff. You, you did not participate in the training of that. You did not do the sweat and the work and the workouts. Um, and on the field towards right. the creation of that, you're claiming something of an achievement that you participate had nothing to do with. But you know what Canwell does have to do with? Asking for closed borders. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, so there you go. I mean, he's well, not responsible for first, any of those right. past achievements, but if he got what he wished for right now, he would be responsible for mm-hmm. very anti-liberty, anti-freedom, uh, racist doctrine right but here's one of the most ridiculous things about it though it, so he's it, both Molyneux and and Cantwell they're so just hot and bothered over Trump and their <laughs> argument is that you know if we don't close the borders we might get these you know it, we might import socialism and, and the welfare state and stuff but Trump has come out as for the welfare state <laughs> right now so how can they be how does that not connect? You know, he's, he's for universal health care. He's for w- welfare. He's really for eminent domain. Yeah. All right. He's also he's vying for the uh, political throne of tyranny. Right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. that should be something you should always be consistent to, to go against, uh, regardless who they are. You know, that's what sort of anarchy is. Uh, without these political tyrants, without these political rulers, without slave masters. Yeah. Uh, and for me, that's my litmus, te- litmus test. In terms of if you're an anarchist, do you advocate against slave masters, political rulers? Um, for me, do you advocate for open borders? Right. You know, the only borders that matter are private ones. Uh, o- open borders; those are just uh, public land. That's just mm-hmm. land the government prevents people from homesteading. That's what that's, those are land right. prevents uh, that's controlled by a gang of thieves and murders preventing people from uh, setting up. You have like over a like, third over the United States here, for example, that's you, people can't homestead and, uh, and own. And if and I a own a big chunk of that, it's owned yeah. by the UN now. <laughs> but if I own a farm somewhere in the United States, or I own a restaurant, or I own a school, or I own a house, or I own a commune, or I own a library, or I own. <laughs> A toy store, what have you. I own any piece of property, any business, any um, social group that meets somewhere, and I want someone across this imaginary border to come participate in what I'm doing. And I say, yes, this is my space or my group's space. We own it. I own it. Please come participate. You may stay here. You may work here. What have you. 
nobody should have a problem with that. Right. Nobody should have a problem with that. Or if you do have a problem with it, get over it. Allow me to do it. Have your own personal problem right, yeah. <laughs> inside of your mind and say, you know what? My personal problem is my personal problem. And your ability to have your friends, your associates, your coworkers, your employees, what have you, on your property, doing what you want to do with them, as long as it's consensual, trumps my bias. Right. That is the only stance I think that you can you know, logically, consistently take on this issue. And so anyone that doesn't take this stance, I think, is misrepresenting themselves as far as uh, what their principles are and you know, how they're doing and carrying out their principles. Right. And in other words, I find a lot of these people then acting like jealous animals trying to protect yes. their zoo bars. Absolutely. Um, which is absurd. That's the entire thing we're trying to abolish. Um, yeah. And so. You hear it from uh, the historically left-leaning anarchists, often that phrase, the revolutionary means must be consistent with the revolutionary ends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is a perfect example of that. You can't close the borders because you think you'd like them to be open later. <laughs> I mean, that, that makes no sense. Basically, right. anything that you yeah. say, it, if it's followed by from the left anarchists, <laughs> Mal, or, uh, Cantwell will just flip his oh, yeah. lid and just shut you down. Because no one in the past that had a different name than we do now ever had something... <laughs> Right. <laughs> so that's, um, I mean, even my mind story. Um, um, my grandfather escaped from uh, communist Cuba in a mm -hmm. dust cropper plane, landed in the Florida Keys, uh, his public property and on private land, um, and made his way through here. Um, my, my mother herself, uh, leaving uh, poverty strife Bolivia, coming here to the United mm -hmm. States, being an American. Um, I'm rife of a lot of uh, immigration people coming working here and, and doing great stuff. Um, I. But there's no problem, I guess, I find uh, in terms of people kind of moving across spaces that nobody owns. Because that's mm -hmm. essentially what, you know, again, these borders are. Uh, they're not, there's, there's no one that they're trespassing on those kind of properties. Well, there. Uh, I mean, it, we could take this a level deeper and maybe this would be a great topic for another show. But, uh, or potentially that space is owned by someone from long ago before the federal government seized it. You know, um, you had native people that were occupying those lands. It, maybe no one know, owns it or... I don't know who owns it, but I can tell you who definitely doesn't own it, and that's this imaginary federal government of the United States that lays claim to it. They have zero claim to it, zero claim to it. And if there's someone else that wants to come here, um, sure. Yeah, no, let's now do you've it. Got, you've but, got me not sure because you know that all of this land was <laughs> owned by the Native Americans until all the white people came in and imported. Well, 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 but we forget. We forget a big <laughs> that's thing. A great <laughs> point. I mean, <laughs> we forget the American Indians, though, were not as people. They were just as brutal as uh, their European counter states sure. yeah. uh, They did a lot sure. of genocide, uh, human sacrifice. They didn't call it taxation, they call it tribute, mm -hmm. uh, especially in South America. So, so there's genocide, no... is, uh, genocide is, of course, only bad when white people do it. it right. It's like, you know, gen even though, you know, the Western, Western cultures are the cultures that, that started to put an end to a lot of this, like uh, slavery. The end of slavery started with the Western cultures, it, you know, and slavery existed in all, you know, in in China and Africa and in in North and South America. America. Yeah, it, it it slavery has existed. It's not a construct of white people. So if claiming that white people are the big, you know, uh, the people that that enslaved everybody is is bunk. That's crap. Right, so that and that's why I bring up the American Indians part because uh, the Incas and in, are in Bolivia, so I have a good uh, understanding of their history and a lot of the atrocities they've done to a lot of the other right. neighboring tribes. So it's always been a constituted warfare. The only thing that uh, took place here when the Europeans came along is that the Europeans had a better efficient version of statism. So right. it was very easy then for the American Indians here to accept that because for a long for to be uh, a, a, I guess acclimatized or uh, adopted into the culture hegemony because they've already existed there before a slave master and a slave possession relationship. So this is just a European model. Land can only be rightfully claimed and owned peacefully. Right. And the United States government does not hold the land in that manner. It's a question, as to, has anyone ever held the land in that manner? Right. Um, and certainly, though, if someone now wants to come participate peacefully, please come participate peacefully. The more people that want to come to America <laughs> because they will want to work and better themselves and better their families, and that's their main interest in being here, wonderful, please. You know, uh, I know a lot of people that are already here that 
I don't know what <laughs> they're doing or why they're here, but uh, you know, we shouldn't be excluding anybody on the basis of imagining what horrible things they're gonna do because of their race or their nationality right. or their any other attribute you could. Our, our tribe has a lot of people from a lot of different uh, nationalities and all over the place and different religions. Um, the well, one, go ahead. Uh, well, multiculturalism is only a problem when it's forced. Yeah, when it's forced, yeah. yeah. And then that's not uh, you know, what our tribe's about in, in that regard. Uh, you know, here in Richmond, there's a lot of different kinds of people who live here already. Uh, and one thing I just wanted to, to bring up is when people try to advocate for like uh, white dominant cultures or something like that, not so much that uh, they're advocating that uh, these guys are, are the best or anything. You're, you're doing the same thing that people who claim cultural appropriation do. You know, you're mm-hmm. celebrating now an accident of birth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you have nothing to do with, with any of that success or any of the people's uh, achievements or doings that they've created or uh, ideas that they come with. The, uh, yeah, the only path to the good is to be good yourself right now, right. period. That's it. That's it. So, thanks for being on the show. We look forward to Thank having you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We can talk about uh, property titles, yeah. operations, get into, get into some sticky business later, maybe. Yeah, no, this is fun. This is fun. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Uh, thank you for watching. This is your news from underground. This is Cam Olin. I'm Phil Pollard. I'm Michael Tiger Shinzius. See you guys at Victory Party. Take good care. Left behind, dollar signs rule. But what about the fool who falls victim to the material world?